Good afternoon. Welcome to MCIE's Transition to Adulthood Fall Webinar Series, which is being co-sponsored by Brooks Publishing. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I'm Barb Gruber from MCIE, and I'll be your facilitator for this webinar. Um, there's a special offer from Brooks Publishing for the series. By registering for today's webinar, you get an exclusive 30% discount on any Brooks books authored by the webinar presenters. Uh, and the authors include Teresa Grassi, David Test, and Carrie Shogren. With that in mind, I want to remind you before we begin about our final webinar in the series, which is uh, with Carrie Shogren on December 2nd and she'll be talking about self-determination and transition for students with disabilities. Um, during all the sessions, you'll be muted, and you can type questions in the chat window. Presenters will try to answer the questions as they come up. Today's session is on evidence-based instructional strategies for transition with Dr. David Tess. David is a professor of special education at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where he teaches courses in single subject research, transition, classroom management, and professional writing. The majority of his publications have focused on self-determination, transition, community-based training, and supported employment. He is currently serving as a co-director of the National Secondary Transition Technical Assistance Center and is a co-director on North Carolina Indicator 14 Post-School Outcomes Project. Um, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, David. Let me get the presentation up. OK, <coughs> here we go. Uh, OK, thank you, Barb. Uh, hello, everybody, and a special hello to Amy Pleat, who, who is the one name on this list that I know. Um, and if... Uh, if you, if any of you uh, are at DCDT next week in Williamsburg, uh, please uh, come up and say hello to me. Introduce yourself, uh, and you don't have to tell me whether you like the the webinar or not. Uh, when I uh, wrote, helped co-author the textbook, uh, one of the texts in the series, uh, uh, they didn't tell me I would be doing these webinars. In, in fact, uh, they have my, they're holding my wife and daughter hostage at the moment. Uh, and will only release them if I once I'm finished. Uh, so, uh, so say nice things. Uh, maybe I'll get them back. Um, so I've got an hour or so uh, to talk to you about a few evidence-based instructional strategies uh, for secondary transition. Uh, again, like Barb said, if you have questions, uh, type them in the chat box, uh, and uh, I'll try to get to them. Uh, as I as I see them, and then Barb has promised to help me uh, to to help me notice them if I if I don't don't notice them. Um, so here goes. I'll do the next. Okay, uh, you're all. I assume since you're on this webinar that that you already know how secondary transition is defined in the federal regs. Um, it's a long, complicated definition, and, and I don't have it memorized. But I really like uh, Andy Halpern's definition, uh, that it's a period of floundering that occurs for at least several years after leaving school as adolescents attempt to assume a variety of adult roles in their communities. I think that pretty much nails it. Um, I, uh, as I myself, uh, went to college and floundered around in college for a few years. And then when I... I left that school, I floundered around for a few more years. So it would have been nice to have maybe some transition planning, uh, maybe a few transition services while I was in high school or college. Uh, but I do understand that period of floundering. And, and really what secondary transition is all about is having students flounder while they're in high school, but with good support. Uh, and to me, that's what transition services are about, is helping kids uh, have a safety net uh, while they're in high school, so so that it's not quite as critical when they lose their jobs or something happens uh, and they don't become boomerang kids. Um, one of the uh, the ways that um, they've people have talked about transition is is really talk about it in terms of transition focused education. Paula Kohler and Sharon Field back in the early 
2000s, uh, introduced a term called uh, transition-focused education. Uh, today, uh, the uh, transition-focused uh, education is is really called um, college and career ready. I'll turn my volume up a little. Um, so while you know it's you can think of transition focused education when you think about college and career ready, uh they're very much the same thing. Um, those of you that have been around a while, and I'm not including you, Amy, um, will know that when transition really was sort of started in, in 1984 when Madeline Will suggested the Bridges model. And if if you've been around transition for any length of time and you've seen uh, the uh, the logos of different transition programs, uh, many bridges, there many of them have bridges on them. They really come from the Bridges model. Um, and it was really about going from high school to employment. And there were no special services which you and I could could get. Um, Time-limited services, primarily vocational rehabilitation, and ongoing services were uh, were support was supported employment at the time. Uh, but quickly, um, the the field decided that you know there was more to life than just work. Um, they must not have been teachers, but uh, they uh, they decided the field. And Andy Halpern again was helpful here. Uh, he talked about from high school to community adjustment. Again, he had the three three bridges of generic services, time limited and ongoing special, but community adjustment rested on three pillars of residential environment, where you're gonna live, uh, employment, and then my favorite is the social interpersonal networks, because if you look at the acronym for social interpersonal networks, it's S-I-N. Uh, so that's the fun part. Um, so transition was more than just employment, uh, it was to adulthood, uh, or as Halpern called it, community adjustment. So there was a lot going on. And, and because of that, um, transition was, was a very large uh, set of services and supports. And so uh, there have been a couple of different taxonomies that people have tried to organize what those... Um, services and what transition might be uh, and try to categorize it. And one of the, the one that, that we use most often is uh, the taxonomy for transition programming that Paula Kohler uh, put together back in the, the late 90s. Um, and it has five areas, as you can see, student-focused planning, which is, which is sort of student involvement in the IEP, um, IEP development. Transition assessment falls under there. Uh, student development is all the skills that we teach kids, uh, from academic skills to life skills to, to career vocational skills. Um, any of the skill teaching that we do um, goes under student development. Uh, interagency collaboration is another important piece um, that we have, uh, you know, we have it going on. Uh, family involvement. Uh, with family training, family empowering, empowering them, teaching them uh, what, uh, te teaching them about transition, what it is, uh, getting them involved as much as possible. And then program structure is the fifth area that these are the things that have to happen if the other four things are going to happen. So you have to have, you know, policies. You have to have resource allocation. Uh, that allow you to do community-based training that maybe have a transitional spe specialist in your school, uh, that you've got uh, good professional development going on, uh, that you're working across uh, parts, maybe with career tech ed, that, that what you're doing fits in the framework of, of everything else. And I think that's where the, the college and career readiness piece that we do um, fits because everybody's doing college and career ready right now. Um, and it makes sense that the transition would be part of that. So it's not an add-on. It's just part of what we're doing for all kids uh, in schools. Um, the other thing that is we've used the taxonomy for here at NSTAC uh, is to uh, to 
look at and try to advance to identify evidence-based practices uh, that teachers can use. And, and these are practices that come from experimental research, and they are research-based, and they're evidence-based. Uh, there's enough studies that are high quality that, that we're willing to, to call them evidence-based. Uh, and they're divided into the different categories or parts of the taxonomy. So. You'll see there's a, a number in student-focused planning, and they're pretty much around uh, teaching kids to get involved in their IEP process. Uh, student development, that's where they mostly are. And if you're familiar with any of the, the previous research, uh, you'll know that the research in secondary transition has been all about that. It's been all about teaching kids skills, lots of different skills. But still, there's so much, there's so many skills that we don't know about or we don't have good solid research about how do you teach those skills. Probably it's very similar to how you teach the other skills, but, but it would be nice to have more of those skills. So if anybody out there is looking for a dissertation or a thesis topic, uh, you've got plenty to choose from or give me a call and I'll give you some ideas. Uh, we don't have very, we don't know much about family involvement. There's just one um, evidence-based practice. There's a few in program structures and if you've been paying attention so far, you'll notice there's nothing under interagency collaboration. In fact, it's not even here yet. So while we know interagency collaboration is important, the correlational research shows us that it's a good predictor that the more collaboration you have or a, you have around a kid or a kid has, uh, the more access they have to, to different uh, adult services, um, the, uh, the better their post-school outcomes are. But we don't really have any methods, any strategies on how to do it. So again, another really good research topic uh, for someone who needs a research topic. Uh, so, so we've got, we, we, we have a start as to, to what are good instructional practices, and we have them uh, categorized by different parts of the taxonomy. Um, so I think we're in a place, a better place than we were, um, say, 10 years ago. Uh, but there's still we still have much to learn. Uh, so I obviously in the, in the 48 minutes I have left, I can't tell, talk to you about every one of the 63 or so evidence-based practices on this sh sheet. So instead, I'm going to take a different tact. I'm going to sort of talk in general. I'll talk about two specific ones, but then I want to talk a little bit about data collection, um, which are important. No matter which is important. In, no matter which of these skills or, or practices or instructional strategies you choose to work with. So let's talk a little bit about teaching strategies. Um, and again, I'm going to start with, with some general uh, considerations and then focus in on just two of my favorites uh, since, they allow, they, since that's one thing. Even though they've got my family hostage, uh, they did allow me to to pick uh, my favorite topics, and so that's what I did. So let's talk a little bit about teaching strategies. Okay. Um, the, you got, to me, it, it, I think we're in a tough place right now, uh, and you in particular probably as, as teachers and uh, transition specialists are, are also in that tough place. Uh, you've got to design instruction that will help kids be prepared to achieve their post-school goals in education and training, uh, in employment, and if necessary, independent living. Uh, so you've got that, but at the same time, you've got this balancing act between grade level academic skills and teaching them some of the other skills that are crucial for them to be uh, independent and have a good quality of life. Um, I, th this is a nice follow-up because I, I believe that's what Teresa talked about last week or the la in the last seminar um, or webinar. Um, so she was talking about some of that, the balancing act too. Uh, so I'm not going to get into that so much, but I, I do want to recognize that up front, that there is this balancing act. Um, I think if you, th it, one way to think about how do we do that, how do we balance this, is that um, we, to prepare students for post-secondary success, and that's in, in any of the education and training, employment, or independent living, first your content should be community referenced 
and their instruction should be community-based or classroom-based. Sounds pretty simple, um, but let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, community reference instruction, okay? How is that different than community-based instruction? The community reference instruction is sort of helps you decide what to teach. Uh, and it really, you, you think about the student's next environment and what skills do they need to be successful where they're going next after they leave high school. Um, so if the kid's going to a community college, clearly they're going to need some skills, academic skills, uh, and some other skills uh, to make sure, depending on where they're living. Um, if they're living at home or living on their own, there's, there's a set of skills there. Uh, if they're going to a four-year college, um, again, academic skills. Uh, I know that my clothes would have preferred that I'd have had some uh, some laundry skill training before I tried to do my laundry at, at college. Um, and my wardrobe would have been uh, happy with that. Uh, but the other thing to think about is what are the things in the environment, in the community, in your community where you're teaching? Uh, where, what kind of stores do you have? What kind of uh, entertainment do you have? Uh, what, did you, what do your ATMs look like? Um, do you have sporting events that kids will attend? Uh, you know, what does your environment look like? The, the, the instructions you'll be doing should be referenced to that community. Uh, then the question is, where do you teach those skills? Um, one place... One good place would be to do that in the community, and then another place would be in a simulated setting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of each of those. So the community reference instruction speaks to the next environment, um, whether that be whether they're leaving town to, to go off to, a, 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 to school or they're staying there and getting a job or going to community college, um, or they're going some other place for community college. Uh, it, that the community reference instruction speaks to the, the next environment. The community-based instruction and simulated settings speaks to where are you going to teach those skills. So, community-based instruction. Well, obviously, uh, it has some, some strong benefits. Uh, it is an evidence-based practice. It has a number of high-quality studies uh, that demonstrate that community-based instruction is, is an effective way to teach kids skills. And it makes sense because if you're teaching the kids in the environment where they're going to use those skills later, uh, then it, it then the odds of them using it later in those same environments increases, uh, and it allows you to deal with the irregularities of the community. Uh, it, you can't control everything, and so things happen. Um, People get lost. People intrude on your uh, your training. Uh, there's distractions. Uh, materials and places can change. Um, so there's lots of irregularities that you know make instruction kind of a pain sometimes. But it also makes makes the learning environment more real. Uh, and so those are some of the the major benefits of uh, community-based instruction. Um, some of the challenges, well, you probably know these. Uh, transportation is, is always an issue. Um, and whether it's in, in a large school system or small school system, um, getting, getting transportation and, and setting that up can, can be a problem. Uh, permission to leave school regularly uh, is another problem, and it's often tied to either the next one, the, there's, no fine, there's no money to do it, or there's no transportation to do it. Um, or, you know, we can go on a field trip, but we can only go on Friday, and that's the way it is. Um, so that, those could be a challenge. And then, then, you know, if you've got to do instruction at school and in the community, uh, scheduling that, staffing those uh, can be a challenge. Another issue with... Uh, CUNY-based instruction is to try to, to maintain as much as possible the natural ratios so that you're not taking 10 kids into a community setting and trying to teach them 
uh, you can't overwhelm the setting. The idea is to not have more kids with disabilities than are typically in an environment. So that pretty much leaves it down to you know, just a couple and not large hordes of, uh, of kids going out at the same time, which, you know, if you go back to the previous slide, transportation and scheduling, it's a tough balancing act. Uh, so to the extent it's possible, trying to maintain those natural ratios is important so that, that you know, for one, for one, it's it's easier to teach that way, and for two, uh, think about the natural community and and their reaction to to large groups of folks, whether they be old folks coming off of a, a tour bus uh, or a group of kids with disabilities coming in. It's not looked on positively um, by the people that are already in the environment. Um, so <clears throat> another thing to consider with uh, community-based instruction you know, are, is trying as much as possible to maintain the natural ratios when you're out there teaching. Okay. So <clears throat> there's another option, and that's to do simulated instruction or, or in your classroom or, or in your school. Um, again, research also indicates <clears throat> that this this is a good way to teach. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, kids learn skills, um, and it's probably easier to do because it's, it involves the instruction that we do typically uh, in a classroom. Um, in your, you can do small whole groups. You can individualize, um, and it's, it's it's just what we do. Uh, the 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 big advantage to me for simulated instruction is that. <clears throat> teachers, that you have an opportunity to do lots of practice, to give kids lots of opportunity to respond. Um, when you're out in a community, if your kid, you're teaching a kid to use an ATM, uh, unless they have a lot of money in there, uh, it's hard to do more than one trial a day because um, you're not going to be able to, to take out a bunch of money. Uh, however, if you have a... Uh, a simulated ATM in your classroom, you could do lots of practice trials around that. Uh, again, so if you're finding, and when you go out in the community, if they're having specific problems with specific steps in the task analysis, taking it back to the classroom and giving them lots of opportunities to practice those particular holes in the task analysis or the steps that they're having problems with, that allows you to do a lot of mass trials uh, in terms of, of giving them a lot of opportunity to respond, a lot of practice with, with some of those skills, which can't really be done out in the community easily. Some of the challenges with simulated instruction um, is that you have to try to make things as, as real as possible. Um, and sometimes it's it's hard to do that. Um, you know, using pretend money is not exactly a, a a good way of teaching kids how to count money. Uh, it's always good to do to use real money uh, to do that. Um, and it's it's hard to set up situations, uh, restaurants, grocery stores, laundromats. Um, they all are hard to replicate uh, in schools. Um, so, while it's it's a it's a can be an effective place to give students lots of practice, it's also hard to make it seem as as real realistic as possible. Uh, so you have some of those drawbacks, and and since you have control, you you lose some of the unpredictability that can happen um, when you're out in the community. Uh, which at the time when you're in the community, it's a problem, but it's also a good it's giving students the ability to to respond when different things happen uh when things aren't always uh the way you plan them and then that happens a lot in the community so <clears throat> my recommendation um and this is my recommendation uh, other people may <clears throat> will think differently 
uh, <clears throat> is that to pair simulated instruction with community-based instruction. Um, we've got you, there's a lot of research that shows that this is a very effective way and actually some of the, uh, the research that actually compares simulated to community-based instruction to simulated with community-based instruction shows that commu simulated with community-based instruction is a very effective way to do it uh, and often the most effective way because, of, because it gives you the best of both worlds. It allows you to have the realistic training, but at the same time it allows you to, to practice and get more practice in a simulated setting. So you're giving them exposure to the community, but at the same time, um, you have more instructional opportunities back in the classroom. Uh, so, and I'll show you in a minute a, 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 an idea for how you might balance all of this uh, so that you're maintaining the natural ratios uh, and not being as conspicuous as as being less conspicuous when you're in, in the community. So here's, a, here's an example of a week-long um, simulated instruction CBI plan. And if you'll notice, if you notice on Monday um, that you've broken the kid, the kids are broken into different groups and uh, one's with a teacher, one's with a, with a para, uh, or maybe a job coach, and then one group is independent, and they're doing different things. Um, and so by working with these groups, uh, as you go from day to day, uh, you can have kids, some kids in the community, uh, and some kids in classroom, uh, And this is this seems to be a this is one potential plan for for allowing the two to happen together um, as you, as you go through uh, the week in terms of going from simulated to to, to community based. And I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here with this because you have a chance to uh, you'll have a chance to to see this again uh, when Barb sends you the. Uh, the PowerPoint tomorrow. So, I said earlier that uh, you know there on the the one slide with the uh, evidence-based practices. There's 63 evidence-based practices on that page, and obviously I don't have enough time to get get through all of those uh, today. Uh, so, as I said earlier, I chose two of my favorites, um, and I choose them. Um, why they're my favorites? Well, one, I'm I'm sort of into uh, the whole self determination thing, um, so teaching kids to self monitor um, falls right under that. And then I'm I think it's important that kids you know get taught skills that they're going to use and that and that they get taught in a way that that um, that they have a better chance of of generalizing those skills to other settings and other situations. So, you know, I chose these two. There are, are many others. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about these two. Um, so, um, self-management, in particular, via audio prompting. And I think I like this partly because uh, it's, once you have them, it's, it's easy to use them again. Uh, so, you know, if you're old-fashioned like me, you might have used tape recorders uh, for your students, but nowadays uh, you're probably using iPods or uh, other more advanced technology uh, to, uh, to, do your, to do this. And then basically, you know, you take a task analysis um, and uh, break it into to different steps in the task, um, and record that onto uh, uh, an iPod, uh, and then have the then you teach the students to use the iPod to 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 go through each step as as you're talking them through the step. Uh, so the steps, the iPod, and they get the prompts to the steps in the task analysis. Um, 
So obviously the benefits, it can be used any place. You can teach the kids to do this in a simulated environment in the classroom. You can then have them go out and practice it around the school uh, and then before they get out in the community. Or they can, you can start straight in the community and teach them there. Uh, it allows students more flexibility because they can start and stop as they need it. Uh, and because they're independent, uh, eventually there should be less teacher time. Obviously, you're going to have to teach them to do it in the beginning uh, and stay with them for a while while they're, they're learning to do it. But once they, they get the hang of it, um, it allows you to go, go work with students who may need um, more of your attention. Um, and finally, I, you know, one of the things uh, that I see a lot with community-based instruction is that the student finishes a step of the task or their task, and then they stand there and wait because they don't know what to do next. Uh, and so this is a, is a good way of, of getting, keeping the, the students moving forward in their tasks. Uh, and if you, you could do one task and then prompt them to move on to their next, next task, and so you could have multiple tasks uh, recorded um, so that they know then to, to continue to switch tasks and not just wait for someone to come to tell them what to do next. Uh, typically, uh, it's done on a least to most prompting hierarchy. Um, probably... If the teacher is going to be around to, to give the prompts in the beginning, you can use the least to most. But uh, unless you're going to go to, to video modeling, uh, you probably can't do uh, demonstration as a prompt. Uh, the prompts are going to have to be, be audio prompts. Uh, so if audio prompts don't work, you can, give, you can model it for them in, in real time or... If, if you think they're going to need a model, then, then video prompting is probably the best way to go. Um, the other thing that you can build in, which I think is a great idea into the, the self-monitoring, self-management piece, is sort of a self-evaluation. Uh, and the example, one of the examples here is, um, you know, put the basket on the floor in front of the dryer, and the audio may include, is the washer empty? Okay, so it, it gives a kid a prompt to uh, to think, you know, I better look back in there, make sure that I got all the clothes out of the dryer or the washer. Uh, and it says, great, and then put the clothes, and then it goes on to the next step. So it, it gives the students a chance to, to evaluate their performance on each step. Did you do this thing? Yes, okay, then do the next one. Uh, so they're always getting a chance to think about, did I complete the step correctly? Yes or no, before they, they do the next step. Uh, so I, I really like the idea of, of building in some self-evaluation into uh, to your audio prompting, or, or if you're if you're really into it, to it, your video prompting. Okay, training for generalization. Uh, well, basically, th there's a number of different strategies. The bottom line is we're teaching in a manner that supports the students' use of skills in situations and settings that are different than when you where you train them. Uh, there are six different strategies and I'll talk to you a little bit about and then I'll give you some examples of, of those strategies. Um, and these are strategies that would be very important for you to build into your instruction. As you're teaching kids skills, if you can build in a couple of these strategies, uh, these are strategies that have been demonstrated time and again to, to increase the uh, student's ability to generalize them to other places, uh, other settings, with, and with other kids, uh, or with other people. Uh, I say it's a social skill. Um, you probably want them to uh, say hello and, and respond to other people's questions, um, not just yours. So programming common stimuli, it's re this is really about the teaching materials, uh, making uh, your materials uh, as similar as possible to the materials uh, in the community that where the kids will be doing the skill. Um, and I'll give you some examples in a couple minutes. Uh, mediate generalization. Uh, this is where, this is about uh, teachers provide instruction on a co-behavior which is designed to assist the student in generalizing target skills to new settings and situations. Yes, what does that mean? Uh, 
Uh, I think self-monitoring, the self-management, the stuff that that we just talked, I just talked about, uh, is, is a really good way by teaching kids to be able to self-manage and self-monitor. Those skills can go anywhere. You know, it's kind of like um, it's really going back to the first one, the program and common stimuli. What's the one thing that is wherever the student goes, and that's the student. Uh, I am where I go. Um, and so by teaching the students to self-monitor and self-manage, um, that skill cuts across any environment they're going to be at, be in. And once they're, they're taught how to do those things, that they're taught to self-monitor and self-manage, uh, it should improve their, their ability to, to do those skills no matter where they go. Um, teach functional target behaviors. Um, things that uh, will be likely to be reinforced in the natural environment, uh, things like manners, uh, following your boss's directions, um, you know, um, pain, using the dollar more than strategy or the one more than strategy uh, when you're checking out or getting money out of an ATM. Those are all things that uh, will be likely to be reinforced in a natural environment. Uh, so, and this can tie back to the community referenced instruction. Uh, those skills that in those places, teaching kids skills in those places uh, where they're going to, to go grocery shopping, uh, the movie theater they're going to go to, the bank they're going to go to, if, if it's possible to, to teach to those settings um, you're, and teach them skills that they can use in those settings, uh, it's much more, po much more likely that they'll generalize and be able to use those later. Um, train loosely. Um, you know, we're, we're often all about structured and very systematic instruction. Um, that's all really good to do. Uh, but at the same time, um, kind of the teachable moment piece um, so that you're not always teaching the same thing at the same time every day. Um, if there's, there's ways to teach it at different times and in different situations, um, so that it, you know, the behavior doesn't kind of, okay, it's 10 o'clock, we have to do ATM training, and I can only do ATMs at 10 o'clock, so uh, if I have, if I end up in the community and have to do an, you know, get money out of an ATM at 3 p.m., well, uh, I don't know what to do, I have to wait till 10 o'clock the next morning. Um, so training loosely, um, teachable moments uh, is, is, a, is a good way to, to help facilitate some generalization. Um, Teaching, again, this sort of ties back to an earlier one, um, teaching skills that will be naturally reinforced. Um, again, social skills, um, skills that will allow them to buy, buy food or, or go to the movies uh, where they can, you know, they get natural reinforcement as they're, as they're doing the behaviors. Um, and then using enough exemplars or enough examples. Um, you know, sometimes we teach them how to get get uh, snacks out of the snack machine in the teacher's lounge. Well, that can be different. I mean, those those machines are really different uh, depending on where you go. Uh, so just teaching one example uh, doesn't allow the kids to uh, to go use another. Uh, say the, you're the laundromat. The, when you go into a laundromat, uh, they usually have to put some money in the machine, but where you put it in is different. Uh, which buttons you push are different. Uh, so if it's possible to teach more than one example, uh, that's a really important thing. ATMs are another good example. Uh, they, they change um, from bank to bank often. Um, so, so think about the the examples uh, that you're using as part of your instruction, and make sure that they sample the range of possibilities, or or at least more than one. I, two or three different kind of exemplars are are probably best to use. And and if you can think about and do it systematically, uh, and think about which do I have? Do I have to push stuff? Do I have to pull stuff? How many buttons do I have to push or select? 
uh, allow them to, to practice a variety of skills across the different exemplars or the different teaching examples that you're using. So here's some examples uh, for each of those strategies. Uh, for, so for programming common stimuli, um, you may want to think about a certain set of words. Um, you, if you're going into, no matter what fast food you go into, probably someone's going to ask you, may I take your order? Uh, so that's the cue to say, yeah, tell them what food you want. Uh, mediate generalization. Uh, we talked a lot. Of, we talked about self-management. So this example is is setting is a different one in terms of organizing materials. In our world, things usually go from left to right. Uh, so teaching them the left to right sequence, be it in this example, uh, dealing cards uh, or organizing materials. Um, for your for a job, uh, teaching them that that left to right sequence uh, <clears throat> from reading to to many other things in our in our daily lives, uh, that's a it's a good good skill to have. Uh, teaching functional skills, uh, money skills are needed across a variety of environments. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes it's hard to to do anything without having having some money. I, I, availability of money. Uh, so money skills uh, go across a variety. Uh, it's, and it's a skill that will allow students access to a lot of different environments. Uh, train loosely. Um, in this example, uh, setting up interviews with people that they don't know. Uh, don't, pro don't provide the questions. Uh, so because everybody, everybody that they go to interview with they're going to have their own style. They're going to have their own questions. There'll be some common questions, but there'll also be a bunch of different questions, and they might ask them in a different order. Uh, so, so by setting setting up a mock interview, you've got different people that are asking questions, but you also got different questions in different orders. Uh, using the national maintaining contingencies. Well, in most situations. Uh, Personal hygiene and cleanliness is important, so that's another one of those skills. It's almost a functional target behavior, but <clears throat> typically people who are are hygienic and clean um, will get compliments uh, and uh, be better accepted by those around them, uh, especially on the metro. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, uh, using uh, sufficient exemplars or using multiple examples, uh, Cell phone skills, um, you know, cell phones are different um, from from brands and models. Uh, so uh, teaching them how to use a, a variety of different cell phones, uh, if possible, and you probably could collect those from the kids in the classroom. Uh, so those are just different examples of, of how you can design no matter which teaching strategy you're using, if you go back to the, the list of teaching strategies, the evidence-based practices, um, those, no matter which of those strategies you use, you can build some of these instructional generalization strategies into your instruction to do that, to, to help promote the possibility that students are going to use these skills over time and in other environments. So, in quick summary, uh, it's important for, for students, they need explicit instruction. Many students need explicit instruction to learn, maintain, and generalize skills. Uh, and that the two teaching strategies I talked about, uh, self-monitoring and the generalization strategies, um, should help them improve the likelihood that they'll not only acquire them, but they'll uh, use them after they graduate and after they leave you. Uh, so let me talk for the last few minutes about um, data collection strategies. Um, here's some reasons you could probably think of your own. Um, I like um, that you're able to document the effects of your instruction and to show students that they're learning is sort of the same thing. Um, and that when you think about it, any data that you collect is really part of the ongoing transition assessment project process. Um, it allows you to, 
to, to find out whether student, how quickly students learn. Usually when students learn something fast or without lots of problem behaviors, it means that they, they, they don't mind doing that behavior or that skill or that job. Uh, but when they have lots of hard, they have a hard time learning it and they have lots of behavior that gets in the way, that's a, that's a sign that uh, maybe that's not something they're real interested in. So I think using data are good and they're, uh, they're really part of the ongoing transition assessment process, but they do tie back to uh, you know, making your instruction better. Uh, therefore, simple steps in collecting data, first identify the skill to be taught, uh, again, through transition assessment or, any, or other types of assessment, but really at high school, any assessment is transition assessment. Uh, identify the dimension of behavior being taught. Design a data collection system and collect the data and use it to guide instruction. And I'm going to quickly talk about each of those. Um, so bottom line, I think there's two kinds of behaviors. Those that you count, like the number of steps in task analysis, um, the number of steps correct when withdrawing money. Uh, sometimes it's important to, uh, to know how fast someone is doing it. Uh, we taught kids uh, to do uh, for for a ho for a motel maintenance. Uh, they had to clean so many uh, rooms in a, in a in an hour. So it was important that they you know got up to three three rooms per hour. Uh, but in some instances, it's not it's not important how fast you do it. It's just the number of times that you do it, and you keep on doing it. So if you're counting the behavior, I call them countants. Um, And then you've got time it's if it's important for the behavior to occur over time. You've got duration, how long they do it. Sometimes it's just important to be on task and to keep doing that job. Uh, you don't have to do it really fast. Um, so it's not important to know how many you did, but you just have to keep working on it. Uh, or sometimes it's important to get started quickly after someone tells you. And that's latency. It's the time between your, really the time between you're told to do something to start a behavior and when you actually start it. And you want short latencies in that case. Uh, so those are behaviors that you would be, the dimension you'd be interested in timing it. Uh, data collection strategies for, uh, for count it. Uh, basically, you use event recording. And that's anytime you count the number of behaviors uh, that occur. And that's, that's, that also it means the number of steps in a task analysis. Time it. Uh, you can use duration recording where you click a stopwatch every time the behavior occurs and you time how long it occurs. Uh, momentary time sampling I like uh, because you're not having to sit, stand there and watch the whole time. And, and usually teachers or, or job coaches or paras don't have time to stand there with a stopwatch uh, and watch one kid. Uh, and then latency recording, again, is a stopwatch, but, but you're only asking the kid to get started once. Uh, and so that's it's not too difficult to to, to do latency recording. Uh, with event recording, um, you record the amount of time it, a behavior occurs. You can re if if you have the same number of steps in task analysis, you can say okay, you did ten uh, out of twenty. Uh, or sometimes if you don't have the same number, you're going to want to compare day to day. You're going to have to go to percent. Um, it's a simple way. Um, everybody pretty much knows how to do this. Uh, you tally stuff, uh, the steps of a task analysis, um, and people do all sorts of different ways, from risk counters to paper clips to uh, just marking on a piece of paper uh, or or clicking uh, the notes on your uh, on your telephone uh, on on your iPhone. Uh, so there's lots of ways to count. Uh, Time it's, I recommend uh, momentary time sampling, and that's if you have a, say you have 30 minutes, um, you could break the break it into to 10, 30, three minute intervals. At the end of each interval, you have a timer that goes off, uh, and then you look to see whether the kids on doing the job or not, and then you record the the percent of intervals that the kids doing the job or not. And so, if you're interested in keeping a kid on task and doing a job over time, and it's important that they do the job over time, um, I, I recommend momentary time sampling because the odds of you being able to stand there for 30 minutes with a stopwatch 
aren't good, you're going to have to be working with some other kids. So you maybe have a headset on that, that dings every minute or two minutes. Uh, you just quickly check over, see if that kid's still on task, and mark yes or no. Uh, and so it's, it's a simple way of getting at time. It's, uh, it's clearly an estimate. He might be off task the other one minute but the, and when you looked. But, but it, as long as you keep those intervals fewer than three minutes, research shows that you're, you're pretty good about, you're pretty accurate. For duration and latency, the other poss another possibility is is to uh, to use a stopwatch, uh, but uh, I wouldn't do it in la latency, maybe, but not necessarily duration. So here's some examples uh, uh, to teach kids recreational sight words, to read them orally. Uh, it's probably you were interested probably in the number of sight words, so you're going to be counting it. Uh, so you just count the number of uh, of sight words that they can read. Uh, doing laundry during community-based instruction. Again, it's a task analysis here you're using. Uh, so you're counting the number of steps completed. Again, that's a, probably a count it. Uh, exhibiting disruptive behavior. Well, I, this one is classroom, but say it was on the job. Uh, again, if you're interested in the number of times it occurs, uh, then then it's a count it. Uh, and there are different ways of, uh, one way that what I've used often is, is moving paper clips from one pocket to another so that I know at the end I count my, my left, my right hand pocket and that's how many times the kid uh, was disruptive while they were in the, at the community job site. Uh, talking to a peer when they should be working independently on the job, uh, that could be, uh, depends on, whether that's a, something you want to count. It could be that you count it the number of times they're talking, but you also could be looking at when they're not talking, and that's probably what you want to increase. So using momentary time sampling, looking up and seeing whether they're talking or not or whether they're on task. Um, clean a bathroom during community-based instruction. Uh, you could use event recording, but you could also be interested in how long a time uh, if they've if they've got a job where they they come in and they clean the bathroom and then they go do something else and they have to com complete the the uh, bathroom in the first ten minutes, then you want to know: Are they finishing in ten minutes? How long is it taking them? So it's important to not only in that case you might do event recording: Are they doing the number of steps on task analysis, but also the time, so that they're getting the time down to what's required by that job, uh, and then the the time to complete a job application. Um, you know, it may or may not be important. Sometimes you take the job application home with you. Sometimes you want to do it in the office where you're getting it or the, the, at the, in the human resources office. Uh, and you don't want to be there three hours uh, filling out a job application. It's probably not uh, a real good uh, indication that they're going to be interested in hiring you if it takes you three hours to fill out your job application. Uh, so. So, and again, you could record the, the time in class that it takes them so that they're getting it down and, and can do it in a timely fashion if they're, gonna, if they're not taking it home with them. So, uh, some of the issues with data collection. Uh, if you're out in the community, it's, it's, it would be good if you could be as unobtrusive as possible. Again, going back to the, the natural ratios, again, not being intrusive. Uh, and, so, and that's hard to do when you're standing with a clipboard. Uh, provide sufficient data to determine effectiveness of training. So, but you want to collect data, enough data. You don't want to stand there over the, with the kid in a clipboard. But at the same time, you want to collect enough data to, to make sure that what you're, you're, you're teaching is working. Uh, so here's some things to, that, that could help you. Uh, who will collect, how often, and how are you going to display the data? So who can collect? Well, you've probably got either the teacher or the job coach, whoever's there at the site, uh, or the student. So if you teach the kid to do their own self-monitoring, uh, they you might give them a checklist and they check off the task as they go along. Uh, it could be a picture. Uh, we've got, I've had ones with, with not only word cl clues, but picture cues. And once you, you teach them the strategies, they can self-manage and, and collect their own data. Uh, and then having the student record his own can include independent performance and self-monitoring is unobtrusive. Uh, if the student's doing it rather than someone standing there with a clipboard. Uh, now, here's, 
here's a process or a, a system that, that I think works pretty well. Uh, in the beginning, every time you teach, you need to collect data. So if you teach the kid, as you're teaching the task in the beginning, uh, teach it a couple of times, then step back and let the kid do it themselves uh, and see how you're doing it. You don't have to, you can do two or three trials without any data, but, but check. After two or three trials, check and see whether the kid, what steps they've got and what they don't. And then, then you can come back with your instruction and, and focus on the steps that they're missing. Uh, once the kid is up to speed and doing it on a, on a, at a mat, whatever mastery level you have, uh, whether that's 80, 90, or 100%, uh, then you don't have to collect every day. Uh, collect every couple of days. Uh, and then once, once you're, you're satisfied that they're still maintaining that, then go to once a week, once a month if you're still there. Uh, so you can, you don't have to, to, to collect data every time you teach every day. Uh, but you do have to do more of it in the beginning, but as, as the students are getting better and better at it, don't collect as much data. Just collect enough data to make sure that they're continuing to do the task at the level uh, in which they need to do it. Uh, and again, when you're teaching in the beginning, you don't have to, to collect data for every step. Do a couple of trials, then step back, say, okay, try it on your own, then collect your data. Then you, you'll know how your instruction is, is started out and, and use that process. Um, I like graphs. Uh, because I like pictures, uh, and uh, you know the old picture tells a thousand stories or something like that. Uh, words um, clearly, the one graph on the uh, left is one that that you might have constructed, uh, or you could have the student help you with it. Uh, the other one I really like upside down uh, self graphing uh, task analysis, and this is simply. Um, the task analysis for getting the money out of an ATM, uh, the first step is at the bottom and the last step is at the top. And each day you, you mark through the steps that they got correct. Of course, this one isn't right. Um, the first one should have circled a two. I wonder where this came from. Um, the number of steps are then circled correctly, so this is wrong. Um, on the on 111, the number of steps correct on that day were two, so a two should be circled. And then the next day, there were three steps correct. A three should be corrected. And the next is four. A four should be circled. And the next is five. A five should be circled. So the circle should show you the steps, the total number of steps correct. This one is a day is one or two off, um, but. Uh, but the idea is that that your task analysis turns into a graph over days. Uh, so you, you, you've got your task analysis. You know which steps the student's getting right and which they're still struggling on. So you can, you can focus your instruction on the steps that don't have X's. Uh, and you also, but you also see how they're doing and you see that they're slowly improving. Uh, so that's, I love self-graphing task analysis. And basically, it's upside down task analysis and, and graph. Mark the number of steps correct and circle the number, the total number correct. Uh, is a simple way to do that. Uh, and you can you can do this. You can have any, or you can teach your students to do this too. Uh, so, I think collecting data makes your job easier because one, it allows you to know how students are performing on skills being taught, allows you to modify instructions needed provide you with ongoing transition assessment data. Thank you very much. And again, if you're at DCDT next week, uh, say hello to me, please. And I'd, be, I'd be interested in uh, questions and any comments you have uh, at that time. Thanks a lot. So thank you, David. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can type them in the chat box. We have about a minute left. And... Um, I want to Thanks thank fast. you all for joining us today. And we hope you can join our final session with Carrie Shogren on December 2nd.
She'll be talking about self-determination and transition for students with disabilities. And as was mentioned earlier, I'll follow up with you all um, tomorrow probably and send you the, the link for the recording and um, the handout. If you have questions, you can email me at barb at mcie.org. Um, but I see there is a question. David, are you still there? For task analysis. Hey, oh, Judy. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Uh, do you, I recommend any particular model or format? Um, no, I, you know, I mean, you can have a fine-grained task analysis uh, that, that talks about very specific steps or a less detailed that, that groups some of the things together. It sort of depends on your student. Um, I define grain as probably the way to start um, so that you've got every single step and you know exactly what's supposed to happen. Uh, then the more that they get it, uh, the less, less you have to, to use the fine grain. You can, you can maybe put a couple of steps together. Um, but no, I mean, I don't, I don't have a particular model that I'm, I'm in love with. Uh, it really depends on, on the student and the level of detail they need within the task analysis. Um, oh, uh, the taxonomy model, will that be reviewed or updated? Uh, yeah, we we sort of do it as we go along. We really haven't, we haven't published anything yet, but we really need to do something with it uh, to get it updated. If you have some suggestions, uh, my email is right there, or you can talk to me next week. Uh, so, uh yeah, we do need to do something that is a little sounds outdated. It's really not when, when you get into the nuts and bolts, but it sounds outdated, some of the terminology. Uh, but any ideas are more than welcome. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, well, hopefully I'll see some of you next week. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.